Hello and welcome to the intersection of security and data protection, understanding the critical role security plays in data protection strategy. Today's exciting webinar is sponsored by Druva and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Jess Steinbach with Actual Tech Media, and I am absolutely thrilled to be your moderator for this fascinating conversation today. You know, as we look around the modern technology landscape, it's very clear that solutions, tools, platforms, and teams are more integrated and interdependent than ever. And that's wonderful. That is what is allowing us to de-silo, to innovate, and to scale at, at organizations at an ever-accelerating pace. But that also means that it can get harder and more complicated to see the whole picture of your technology architecture and how every little element, every little decision can impact your entire organization. So today we're going to zoom in on one key aspect of that picture, data protection. Now, making the wrong decision about data protection could have serious impacts on your organization's security. So this is an important part of your security planning process. Luckily, today we are joined by not one, but two fascinating speakers to help guide us through this conversation. In just a few moments, I will introduce you to our expert speakers from Druva and from Actual Tech Media. But before we jump in, I'm just going to zip through a few important points about this webinar. Okay, first up. I want to draw your attention to that questions console. So if you haven't already said hello, drop a greeting to your friends here in the actual tech media community, say hi to the other folks out there and make sure that you use that section to ask all of the technical questions that come up today. If there are any technical issues, hopefully that doesn't happen, but this is also a great place to reach out to the actual tech media team. A quick reminder that a browser refresh is likely going to get rid of any of the usual tech gremlins, but if not, drop us a line and let us know. Okay, skipping right along, next to that question section in your console, there's also a handout section. You're going to see some really engaging resources to go along with the webinar today. So be sure to explore and download some of that for some exciting reading after the webinar. And hey, it's not just awesome content that we're giving away today. We also have a $300 Amazon gift card as a prize drawing at the end of the webinar. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live webinar to qualify for the prize, and all winners must meet the actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. If you're still not sure what those prize terms and conditions are, click again into that handout section, scroll down to the bottom, and you can find the full T's and C's listed for you there. Now, I know that this crew is not going to need any additional nudging to ask questions here, but we are big fans of curiosity. So today we're also giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to the best question asked during the webinar. So keep in mind that the team is going to review all the questions asked after the webinar, which means that even if yours does not get asked live, there's still a chance to win. And as always, we will reach out via email to our lucky winner after the webinar. Okay, team, now I know that you are just as impatient to get started as I am, so let's dive right in. I am so excited to introduce you to the one and only Scott Lowe. He's the CEO, co-founder, partner, lead analyst. Really, there is nothing that Scott doesn't do here at Actual Tech Media, and he's going to be chatting with the absolutely fascinating Curtis Preston, Chief Technical Evangelist at Druva. Scott and Curtis, I know that you guys have a ton of exciting content to cover, so Scott, I'm going to hand the mic on over to you. Thank you, Jess, for that warm and wonderful introduction. Um, as Jess mentioned, I'm happy to be here with Mr. Curtis Preston of Druva. Curtis, thank you for joining me for what I hope is a very lively discussion about data protection and backup and recovery and all the things in between. I, I will be as lively as you would like me to be. <laughs> awesome. Well, you're always lively. So um, there's a lot of things we want to talk about in the next little while here. I mean, backup and recovery is um, important um, and it's evolved over the years. You know, we look at what, I mean, when we were backing up when you first started your career, it was a very different tool than we're using now. Um, but along with that comes some need to make sure we evolve these from a security perspective as well. And we see, you know, backups used to be sort of that last bastion of, of protection for a lot of organizations, but they're actually at risk now too. So when we think about modern backups, how do you see them being at more risk than they've ever been before? And what kind of things do we need to consider when we want to start protecting the backup tools and our backups that we have in our environments? Yeah, so I, I started backups. I mean, I feel really old when I say this, but like I'm coming up on my 30th anniversary of my first uh, commercial backup. 
And back in the day, no one, like we were worried about the backups, certainly from a DR perspective, we had to separate them from the, the thing that would might also do damage to our data center. I don't remember ever discussing the, sec the, the electronic security of backups. And th there's a few reasons for that. I'd say one of the biggest of which is that they were all on tape back in the day. That changed drastically in the last 10, 15 years. And we've gone to disk as our primary protection mechanism. Pr protection mechanism. And the problem with that is that when it's sitting there on disk to borrow a, a, um, a slogan from a, a company that's not around anymore, but they used to use the phrase, if it's on disk, it's at risk. And the, you know, they were pushing other ideas, but the, that, that's the concern is that the, that the backups are sitting there on a disk behind a server that is hackable. And if that server is accessed uh, inappropriately, either accidentally by a well-meaning person or maliciously, either because it's a ransomware attack or a rogue admin, or um, maybe it's not necessarily a ransomware attack, but it's someone who's just gained um, uh, privileges that they're not supposed to have access to. And all the data is just sitting there ready to be attacked and uh, either encrypted or deleted. And, you know, that's just simply a risk that we didn't have even, but, and, and if we look at ransomware, the idea of the, the, the ransomware groups like Conti, which sadly is the biggest of the groups, but that they're directly targeting backups, right? The, the, the backups, not only, you know, it, it has moved from being well, it's, it still is the last line of defense, but it's also the first line of attack. So it's just the backup environments are at a much greater risk from an electronic uh, security perspective than they ever were. And as I look at it, essentially back in the day, um, I'm not quite to 30 years, but I'm not far behind you. Um, you know, basically they were auto air gapped, right? When we, thought, when we talk about tapes. Now we traded in a way, you know, our... RTO capability for having all of that security. We would take tapes to you know places like Iron Mountain of all places, things like that. So recovery was much more difficult. Obviously, we've gained a lot of capability around improving RTO, um, but it's come at a cost of putting our backups more at risk. And I mean, what are some of the things you see? I mean, without naming names, but what are some of the things you see in some backup products that you go, yeah? That is just not going to work. I'd say the biggest risk, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'll admit it. I grew up being a Unix guy. I currently use, uh, uh, you know, I'm currently sitting on a Mac, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm more Unix-y than, than Windows-y, if, if I can use those words. But you know, I'm not anti-Windows, but it's just stating a fact by saying that the number one target of ransomware in the data center is the Windows platform. Mainly, I think for a number of reasons, one of them being that it's where you can get an initial infection out at a, at a, a laptop that's out somewhere. Somebody downloads something on there, you know, they clicked on something and that laptop gets infected and then it gets connected to the VPN or brought into the network and it can then infect other servers. And that's how that initial infection happens. The um, my biggest concern are backup servers that are of the same platform that is the primary attack platform, right? Because it 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 hits a laptop, it spreads to a server, and then it spreads to the Windows server. And again, we know that um, that like the Conti ransomware group, and I assume others are directly targeting, they'd specifically go out and look for those backup servers. And they, they actually sniff the network to find uh, certain protocols. And they're like, okay, they have this product. This is what our attack method is gonna be. And then right, right in that server is a directory called C colon backslash backups. Right. <laughs> right. That's just not good. And then it's copied to, you know, it, it might be. And, and by the way, I, I want I want to say because, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a 
upfront kind of guy. These products, they generally do have additional things that you can do to address these issues. My concern is when I talk to the, the general customer base of the, these other products, most customers aren't yet doing those things. And uh, whether it's making sure that it's replicated to an offsite to a, or to a, um, you know, an immutable copy in the cloud, whether it's using an immutable copy on prem, it's just, I, I think that the default installation, right? They're like, okay, uh, you know, because the, the problem, one problem that's been the same since I've started is that no one wants to be the backup guy, right? And so you give it, you give it to the new guy. That's how I got my first job in IT yeah. a long time ago. You give it to the new guy and then he or she goes in there and, and, and they sit down and they're like, oh, okay, I just bought product X. And uh, let me just read the manual and you read the manual and you just go click, 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 click. Right. Yeah. And next thing you know, we've, you're, you've created a windows based backup server with a thing that says SQL and slash backups. Right. And you, and you don't do all those other things. Others, those other things also come with a cost and backups often don't get, you know, cost money. Right. So uh, that, that, that's the biggest concern I have is that these, that, that so many people, have their backups configured in such a way that they're it's very insecure. A couple of things you mentioned there. One is this um, sort of default settings thing. Yeah, I know right. a lot of administrators that the next button is their best friend. Um, it's just mash the next button. And as soon as I get a good backup, well, I've got backups now. And in some cases, their organizations have not necessarily invested appropriately. I mean, some of those things you talk about having to spend additional money, and they see backup as a necessary evil or nothing but an insurance policy they're never going to have to use. Right. Um, and today, I mean, as we look around, all you got to do is pick up a, well, I guess newspapers aren't a thing anymore. All you got to do is read a, read a news blog. And there's not one where you don't see some mention of ransomware um, or some kind of an attack or something happening where there was data loss because people weren't paying attention. And um I'm going to ask a question that's not um, that we haven't really discussed yet, but do you see backup being talked about enough at the board or C level at this point? Um, no, uh, that, again, that's that's something that hasn't changed. The um, it, it, it again, it, it's a bottom up problem. No one wants to be the person to raise their hand in a meeting when I, I, I think what all the way back to the back to the beginning of my career, there was a guy um, that would, he would be the guy to raise a hand. And his question was, are, are we, are we getting this on tape? That was his question. He would ask that in, in every meeting of any new system. No one wants to be that person because they know that the way it works is, I don't know, Joe, are we, why don't you look into that? Right. <laughs> no one, no one wants that responsibility. And so I, I just don't think it bubbles up to the, you know, the level, I think that people think they have a backup system and, you know, they, they bought the cutting edge latest products and, you know, even, even the products that don't have, that aren't based on windows there, you know, many of our competitors are not based on windows, but they still have, um, maybe, maybe ransomware can't hit them but they still could be hit with a privilege escalation problem, right? These are based on Linux kernels. Linux is, is it's not perfect. Um, or they could just have stolen credentials. And, and, and even, even MFA is not impervious to attack, right? MFA, by the way, if you don't have MFA, well, that's just, you're just not doing your job at this point. But even if you do have MFA and if it's based on something like email, or, or, you know, a SMS type, right. That, that is not foolproof. And, um, and so that many of them don't have protections against that or, uh, just simply just again, a junior person trying to do the right thing. Oh, darn it. I meant to clean out the really old backups. And what I just deleted was all the backups for server ABC crap. How do I, yeah. and they're all sitting there on disk. We just deleted them all. How, how do how do I fix that? Right? They don't all have solutions to that problem. So that brings us to the next part of our discussion here, which is really around the human aspect of all of this. Um, when it comes to having to activate a backup recovery plan, 
um, there are myriad ways that humans can <laughs> be the trigger. Um, and it's not just admins, it's end users, admins, I mean, anybody. So what are some of the common ways you've seen humans wreck the place from a <laughs> um, backup recovery perspective? Yeah, you know, you, you know, the phrase human beings, you know, ruining everything since forever. Yeah. Uh, that <laughs> that is that is more true in the data center than anywhere else. I, I would say when I started my career, the number one reason the number one reason I was doing restores was bad disk drives. That was I, I grew up in a time mm -hmm. before raid. And so we were installing production databases for a thirty five billion dollar company on a drive not even a stripe drive it was just a drive i remember doing that and, not for that big but yeah <laughs> yeah so um th th but but nowadays we have ssds right you know we have flash which is way more reliable than a, a spinning disk drive and we have raid and similar technologies um and so that we're almost never restoring because of failed hardware we are almost always restoring because someone messed up uh, or, or, or there's been an attack or God forbid, something like what happened with the OVH fire in uh, France back. I think that was, I don't know, we get first part of last year. And um, th th so human beings, they, they, they mean to do things and they, and they do other things. Like I think of, the uh, Microsoft 365 incident with uh, KPMG, where they meant to delete, they, they used a, a, a retention policy. And what they meant to do was they, they had one user's private chat they wanted to delete. And instead they deleted everyone in the company's private chats in Microsoft 365. I didn't like hear about that one. Snap That's of a finger. Horrifically oh, a unfortunate. Hundred and fifty. Yeah, 150,000 users affected. Oh, wow. and, 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 you know, and it proved my point of like retention policies in 365 are not backup. They're, if anything, a reason to do backup, right? So, and, and imagine if it was, if, if it was worse, if they had wiped out all of the um, email or something like that, right? But th 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 there's things like that. There are, um, you know, one of the concerns you have to be concerned about is, things like privilege escalation, uh, which is where someone gets in at a lower level and then they use, uh, 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 what do you call them? Um, darn it, the, the, the word is escaping me, but uh, vulnerabilities to, to, to basically become a higher level of user than they're supposed to be. And many of those go around things like MFA, right? If you're able to do something like that successfully. People delete their own backups accidentally all the time right where they where they mean to clean things up but they they delete uh you know they mean they meant to delete this server but they delete that server um or they were they're just sort of updating the environment right they're 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 reconfiguring backup servers and they they meant they meant to delete this one which is the old one and they delete that one i think i think the worst case scenario the absolute worst case scenario i can think of was a um, Microsoft, I'm sorry, a, a Google uh, workspace customer it was up in the Bay Area. And they, they had their entire company on G Drive. They were a very cloud first company. So all of their IP was in G Drive. They didn't even do the sync thing, right? Where you can sync it down to your laptop. Oh. And um, then a well-meaning sysadmin thought he was deleting a test account and he deleted their production Google workspace account after which they, you know, they notify Google right away and Google's like, uh, we don't back up your stuff. It's not in your contract. They sued, uh, nothing that happened, but they, they essentially deleted their company. They were a startup and they deleted their company's entire intellectual property that was sitting up in Google drive and poof gone right it's just a well-meaning sysadmin did that and uh, they you know they ceased to exist which is similar to what happened to code spaces when code spaces got hacked in aws somebody got it they got a privilege escalation attack they got their or, or they stole credentials and the guy 
<clears throat> the hacker basically said, you know, give me a million bucks or whatever, and or I delete your company. And they tried to do some stuff to get the hacker out of the account. And he's like, okay, well, boom, bye. And he deleted their entire company. Um, and all their backups, you know, were all in the same spot. <laughs> so right. basically it was a single AWS account. Backups were in that account. They didn't have cross account, you know, cross region backups. And, you know, basic violation of 321 rule. They didn't have, they didn't have um, um, MFA enabled. So the guy just deleted their company. And the, 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 the massive irony is that they were a, supposed to be a company to safely store other companies' data. <laughs> it was a safe space to store your code. That's what code spaces was. And so there were companies that lost all their data in that incident. Sometimes the, it, everything just writes itself. Um, you just actually led into a question we have from our audience from Daryl. And it's a, it's, a, it's a basic question, but an important one. And I, you sort of alluded to the answer already, but how many backup copies should there be is Daryl's question. So there's a, there's a really well-known, we call it the three, two, one rule. Um, you, you know, it's, it's not the end all be all, but it was invented by a, a cinematographer, a photographer, sorry, digital photographer back in the nineties, Peter Krogh, who we had on our podcast, by the way, it's pretty cool. He, um, you know, three, Three copies of the data on two different media. The idea with the two different media is to to have to be to have two different risk profiles, right? So disk and tape, for example, um, disk and cloud, etc. And um, and then one of them being the old thing was one of them being offsite. In the world of cloud, I say one of them being somewhere else, right? So mm -hmm. if you're in AWS, don't have it be like like the code spaces, right? Don't have it be right next to the data. And uh, so, so the quick answer was, was three copies on two different media, one of which is offsite. And this is why I go after things like Salesforce or 365 or G Suite, because while they might have features like essentially a recycle bin or retention policies to store extra copies of your data, it's all inside the same tables that that vendor is using to provide your service. They're not, they're not backups, they're just, just uh, basically database records that are highlighted or not highlighted right and so th those are not backups because you're not you're not following the two or the one you you got the three great but not the two or the one so to me those are absolutely not backups and that's sort of the equivalent of you know i did the backups and i stored the tapes right under the server um yeah you know yeah and i've seen Unfortunately, back in the day, I still saw lots of people do, you know, the, the tapes were sitting in the data center. So there was a fire. There was no backup to your point. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, well, I, what I've seen is people take a Mac and use the, the, the disk tool to partition their hard drive into two hard drives and then use time machine to back up the one hard drive to the other hard drive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know. I don't have words. I don't think that are sufficient to describe my thoughts on that yeah. in a way that's family friendly. Well, when you, you know, when you've been doing this as long as I have, you've seen a lot of weird stuff is all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, by the way, that's not any worse than thinking 365 is protecting your data. It, it's right. the same. You, you, it's their server, their data. The, the word backups is not in your service contract. It's a right. recycle bin. That's it. Have you had user? I remember when I was managing exchange systems, users, we would clean out recycle. We got to a point where we started cleaning out recycle bins and users got mad at us because that was where they were storing their stuff. Yes. Yes. I've and yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that kind of stuff still happens, you know, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. So the next topic of discussion is around common controls. And when we think about you know, enterprise software, ERPs and the like. I mean, there are, in anything really, I mean, even 365 or, you know, any kind of tools you'd find. I mean, there's RBAC, you know, remote based access control, there's all kinds of things. We haven't necessarily in, historically seen that in backup recovery. It's sort of like, if you're the admin, you're the admin, you're the admin. Um, so, you know, they're often conspicuously lacking in backup why are they important and what kinds of controls at a minimum should people be looking for in a backup solution um, if they're looking to make a change? 
Well, uh, I mean, you're right. And it's the same problem that I, that I alluded to earlier, right? No one, <clears throat> no one goes into a company and says, you know, I, I really want us to have the backup system that has the best security. Uh, they're like, I want to have the database, <clears throat> excuse me, the database product that is so fast and has all these great features. No one is, there's no meeting where people are saying, this is what I want in a backup. How can we innovate backup? Yeah, can we innovate backup? <laughs> because the, well, well, what I guess what I mean is that just generally people don't make their purchase decisions, at least based on what I've seen, the way people vote with their dollars. Historically, they, they've gone with products that, that, they, that support their platforms and, and are easy to use and that's it. And they, but they don't, um, they don't, it's the whole, like people vote with their dollars and they haven't, they haven't made this a strong enough um, case for backup vendors to highlight many of these features, I guess, or to put these features in their products. It, it's not that none of them have it, but many of them don't have it, right? You talked about role-based administration. Why does that matter? Well, because I want to have somebody that can schedule the backups and monitor the backups and make sure that the backups are happening and let the other person over there know what he needs to do or she needs to do to, to rerun the backups or reconfigure the backups without giving that person the ability to do any of those things. That it's about minimizing the blast radius. So historically the backup admin, and, and it's still this way in many companies, the backup admin, they are literally the most powerful person in the data center from a blast radius perspective. They have root or administrator on hundreds of servers they have root or administrator on their backup server, and then they have all power within the backup server. That is just, I mean, I used to make a joke that like, be nice to your backup person because they could wreak more havoc than, uh, you know, than anybody because they can delete all the data and all the backups of the data and there's nothing in your backup product to stop them. Even in products, um, again, competitive products that have things like, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, they, they have features that won't allow a, a backup admin to delete their own backups. Uh, that doesn't stop them from booting it from a USB. Again, if what we're talking about is a rogue admin, booting a server from a USB and, and then, you know, just wiping it from a, you know, that kind of perspective. That's not that hard. If you've got physical access, there is nothing that's going to stop you from wiping out data. Right. Uh, and if you, and if you, and you know, I talked to some people online there, they don't really think that rogue admins are a thing. They're a thing. Yeah, they, they are. happen Big all time. the time. There are famous ones and there are, there are not as famous ones. Uh, companies get embarrassed and they don't talk about them. You know, at Druva, we, we have experienced them firsthand um, and uh, att attempts to thwart things. But, um, you know, the role-based administration that limits the blast radius um, you know, the, the immutability features, with lim which limits the abilities of, of it, it does a lot of things that we, we could do a whole webinar just on immutability and what that means. It, it's, it's not the, it's not a binary condition, right? I, like, like, it's not like death or pregnancy, right? You're, <laughs> you're either dead or not, you're pregnant or not. Immutability, it, it, it's a, it's, I, I think of it as a spectrum, right? There are some things of like, yes, you're either changeable or not changeable by ransomware. But what about the 10 other ways that backups can be changed? Because deletion is also a change, right? Right. Um, how are you right. protecting against accidental <coughs> deletion? How are you protecting against malicious deletion? How are you protecting against fire and bit rot and all of these other things, not just ransomware? What I've seen in the last couple of years is competitors focusing just on the fact that they protect against ransomware. But what about all these other problems that are still going on? Ransomware is hot and sexy and scary. So they focus all their, all their you know, and Druva talks a lot about ransomware as too. So we're guilty there too. But there are all these other features and other ways that backups can be compromised that I don't think our competitors are focusing on enough. Um, this is a question came from Deborah. Um, 
it's not directly related, but I think it does have tangential relation to some of the things we're talking about. And and I'll start with the sort of the quick answer, and I want you to provide some more thought on this. But the question is, can a hacker of your phone system access your network? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, the, the, by the fact that they've hacked your phone system, they have, first of all, accessed your network. So the answer is clearly yes. But We've seen, I mean, you know, the target attack of a couple of years ago, the, it was like an HVAC system or something that they compromised and then got to the POS systems across the entire company. So from a backup and recovery perspective, how does a question like that relate? It's a, that's a fascinating question. And I have, I think, a, a really interesting answer. And that is, you know, depending on how that phone system is what it's based on, right? So is it a Windows system? Is it a Linux system? Could they then use that as a further attack point to get into your network? I would go, yeah. <laughs> right. That, that's the, that's just like your answer. That is absolutely true. But I think there's a part that maybe a lot of people don't think about, and that is the phone system might often be used as an additional factor in a multi-factor authentication system. Oh, interesting. Which means yeah. that your, your phone system could be being used as a way to authenticate someone who got a password that they shouldn't get access to, which is why I'm a big fan of more advanced authentication systems like the, you know, the, like the Google Authenticator and things that behave like Google Authenticator. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of SMS or email or phone based. Uh, I mean, if you have no other choice, it's still better than nothing. But I, I'm a much bigger fan of the, you know, the things like the authenticator apps that are out there. There are many choices and any of them are better than a phone system. So, yeah, so a phone system could be used, um, you know, to thwart your MFA. Next question I have is um, around, you know, it's not the, again, this is not something where you're going to go in and you're going to make big waves from an innovation perspective, but it's important, especially as we see increasing amounts of legislation around these things around the world. How can a proper backup and recovery environment ease chaos related to e-discovery compliance and general data governance needs, particularly some of those that are driven by legislation? Yeah, I, I think with that, there are, when, when, when a company is subject or, or you know, governmental organization is subject to various regulations and they have to be able to prove that they either are or are not storing a certain type of data and if they are storing that type of data like personal information they have to be able to access it um historically we we had we really and i believe strongly in the difference between backup and archive but the uh again that could be a whole <laughs> could be a whole other webinar but generally archive focused on the compliant type stuff there are some compliance, there are a lot of compliance things that a good backup system can do that can make sure that you're not storing sensitive data. I'll give you just one example. So for example, you can say, we don't allow uh, spreadsheets with social security numbers in them. So you create a regular expression and, and all spreadsheets that are backed up or Word documents or whatever, they're looking for a regular expression that looks like a social security number, which is pretty easy to write that regex, okay? And then the backup product can look and notice and say, hey, Steve appears to, appears to have a spreadsheet with SSNs in it. You might want to look at Steve. We stopped the backup. We're not going to back up that spreadsheet because that's what you told us to do. And then afterwards, you can actually find out, yeah, Steve's been doing this a while and we just found out right click, delete all of Steve's backups of spreadsheet of this spreadsheet from the backups, right? Uh, that's, that's a perfect example of something you alluded to earlier of the, the, the power and sort of amazing stuff that you can do with a disk-based backup system if it's properly designed. Um, you know, the way Druva stores, every file is like deduplicated. Every, everything we back up is sliced into little pieces, deduplicated and stored as opposed to many of our competitors that store stuff in big blobs like tar balls, that sort of stuff. It's really easy to go in and surgically delete a single file from backups when each of them, when each file is represented by hundreds of little objects stored in S3. It's very easy for us to do that. 
Um, whereas your competitors, they have to actually go in and modify an image, right? Um, and, and delete that file. So I, I think that's probably the biggest one is to make sure that you're not storing certain types of information. You can also, if you have features built into it, you can reply to uh, personal information requests, right? Uh, that's uh, DSARS, right? Where you're, you're uh, don't, uh, uh, darn it. Um, I can't think of what that stands for. Data subject access request, I think. <laughs> so I'm going to Google under, it like, GDPR, while you are. Right? Uh, data GDPR, subject access request, you know, yes. Ah, nailed it. Nailed nice it. First job. Try. Want to um, make sure. So the, the um, where, where somebody's saying, you know, show me all the data that you have on me, right? right. So a, a backup right. product can assist with that uh, because if it's if it's got all the stuff, you're able to, to search for that uh, within the backup product. Excellent. We do have some questions that came in from the audience that I'd like to, some additional questions. Um, and some of them are related. So I want to start with, and it's kind of related to the last question um, that we just, that we just went. There's a question from Ty, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And from Jean or Jean Daniel, and I'm not even going to try the last name. Um, the first one is around approach to, to secure data in the cloud. And the second one is compliance around data storage. Um, I would imagine that these are coming from the context of um, sent, you know, organizations with sensitive data needs. So governments, you know, right. uh, you know, privacy type, uh, you know, healthcare privacy type things. Right. How does a backup and recovery tool, particularly one that can help protect cloud information, help, help these kinds of organizations stay compliant? So there are a number of aspects to various data protection or d data um, you know, regulations, right? Um, from a backup perspective, you want to make sure that, you know, one of the, th one of the jobs as a, as a company that manages data, uh, your job is to protect that data from accidental access, meaning, you know, inappropriate access of that data. And you also have to protect that, the, that data from accidental or, um, you know, disaster, you know, d data loss due to disaster and things like that. I I'd say the first one, that's probably a job of, of, a, of another tool, I mean, the online part, right? The, the, the like, we're not, we're not a, um, a DLP product, right? We're data loss prevention. We're not, right. we're not going to tell you that somebody's taking files off your laptop. That's not our role. But we, what we can do is make sure that the copy that you gave us is not being inappropriately accessed, number one, which is about source side encryption, you know, encrypting it before it ever leaves, encrypting it again with AES-256 when it's stored in the cloud. It's stored in our account, not your account. Again, most of our competitors, the product, the, the backups are on either cloud services or uh, servers that you own and you manage. That is not the case with our service, right? All of your data is encrypted and stored uh, in a separate location in S3. Uh, it's also globally deduplicated, right? We store the data separate. The, there's, there's three parts. There's the data, there's the metadata, and then there's a deduplication metadata. The metadata is like, uh, this is an email from Steve, right? Right. And there's a dedupe metadata, which is what we need to put all those little pieces and parts back together again, the Humpty Dumpty situation. Right. So even if somebody were to inappropriately access your S3 buckets, which are only configured to be rewritable, readable and writable via our uh, application, even if somebody got through all of that, what they would have is a bunch of little, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like handing somebody a, um, the bag from a really good paper shredder. Here you go, knock yourself out. Right. Right. Uh, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to put it all, put it all back together again without the two other pieces of metadata that, that we store in two other separate, completely different um, uh, systems. Right. Um, so, yeah, so th that matters. We do have just to speak to, um, you know, government organizations, we do, for example, we are in gov cloud um, and, and um, the, the, um, uh, we, we, we do have government contract, large government contracts that do use our system. And um, there are different levels of that for different government, governmental entities. You, you just have to ask those questions if you're that type of organization. And we will, it's a very straightforward answer. We either support that type of storage of data uh, or, or we don't, right? Yeah, I think one of the key things you said there is a lot of this, all of this is stored in your account, not theirs, and that helps to yeah. satisfy 
the one part of what you talked about earlier on with the three, two, one rule, right? It's a separate location. And, and, and I, and I see that at, this is the core differentiator between what we do and what all of our customers do. So pick your favorite backup product. There's some really popular ones out there and, and, and some of them have, they're, they're great looking boxes, great looking UIs. Well, you know, huge customer bases. I'm not dissing them. I'm just saying that you kind of have two ways to do really secure backups. You can buy product X, buy server A, buy server B, buy OS A and B and C and D and get a contract with AWS and create an S3 immutable object and, uh, you know, and, and, and configure all of that and then make sure you update the OS of that server and all of that and make sure you're constantly updating the, the to the latest version of backup software on product ABC, uh, which, I, you know, we hired somebody from one of those big companies that came over and they told us that the average time from when they came out with a new release to when that release was actually deployed in customers was 18 months. Holy cow, right? Think wow. about if that's, if that's um, um, security features, right? So you can, you can do all of that. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying it's certainly complicated and fraught with risk and often being done by junior people who aren't fully trained in the matters of information security. Or you can buy a service that does all of that for you. Um, and so some people are like, well, why would I do, why would I do uh, backups as a service? And my answer is, if we can meet your recovery requirements, uh, why in the world would you not do it that way? We can, we can, from a disaster recovery perspective, we support uh, 15 to 20 minute RTO of your entire environment with a one, with a one hour RPO um, with literally just a push of a button and, you know, poof, your entire environment comes up in AWS in your VPC in AWS. Um, I suspect yeah. that the discussion on those, some of those places a lot of places don't see manpower as a cost for whatever reason. Um, I know where I used to work, yeah, they did. They didn't. Um, yeah, and, they, they don't. They don't like a lot of people. Don't like including soft costs and 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 right, uh, right. But I would be willing to bet that the ROI discussion changes dramatically once someone's been attacked. Yeah, and it's and it's not just a cost, right? Because it, it, it is a cost. To to me, it's it's a risk. It's a risk exactly discussion, right? You've got this this constantly revolving door of a new person managing your backup system that has to constantly be incredibly vigilant that they have the copy that is the number one attacks, you know, vector for uh, ransomware. And they have to be just incredibly vigilant. And the thing is, they also have to be incredibly vigilant on their, on the primary. And the thing is, where do you think they're going to focus their attention? They're going to focus right. their attention on the primary side. Yeah. Or they could just use a service, right? Even if we were the same price, from a risk and reward standpoint, it just, it just seems like it's it's to me it seems like a no brainer. The only reason you wouldn't use us, from my perspective, is you know you've got a hundred petabytes of data in a T1 line that isn't going to work with <laughs> us. Right? That's not going to work, right? We we can't violate the the fundamental laws of physics. I mean, we do do source side deduplication. Right. So, and, and we do source side global deduplication. We have customers, we have bigger dedupe databases than any company out there. Right. I've worked with all the other big companies. They, they, they all have some number where their dedupe tops out. We have customers that are deduping 20 petabytes of data in one dedupe database because we have DynamoDB on the back end, which is infinitely scalable. That's where our, where our hash tables go. And, and so we globally deduplicate all your data, eliminating the data as much as possible, then compress it, then ship it up to the cloud only if it's new and unique. And by doing that, we really lower the amount of bandwidth you have. But in the end, there is some number that we can't go over, right? That To me, that would be the only, and by the way, we have answers for recovery, not just backup, but I was just saying, if you can't get it there, you can't bring it back, right? And we have three different ways to get it back uh, a lot faster than you than you would think. And I'll just finish up with that to say, if you think we can't restore faster than your local windows based backup server, give us a shot. We, right. we, we beat, we beat, you know, those folks all the time in, in, uh, bake offs.
speed wise? We have two more questions from the audience and we have a few minutes left. So the first one is sort of a, a modern take on what's happening in the world. Um, you know, how's the security market shaping up for hybrid work scenarios in, 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 in relation to how it impacts data protection? I mean, have you seen the, the work from home trend have an impact on the data protection market? That's like a, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. One of those. that's a, so our, our many of uh, many companies were forced to suddenly give people laptops and to allow them to start using those laptops to store data. And um, if, if that was a surprise to you now, all of a sudden you have to, th and, and many companies don't protect their laptops. And um, so if that, if that came as a surprise to many companies, they then turn to pick your favorite backup product. I mean, I can think of the top three that, that we always end up competing and um, uh, well, I'll say top four, one of them has a laptop backup solution, right? So a lot of people had to really scramble to, or go buy another vendor. We are the leading provider of, of laptop backup solutions. So, and, and we do mobile devices as well. So, our customers didn't have to do anything. They were already protecting their laptops or if they weren't protecting their laptops, it's just a matter of downloading a piece of code and then, and then pointing it at the Druva service. Uh, you know, it's, and it's something that can be automated and rolled out. And then magically you, you just say, look at backup all documents or spreadsheets or whatever it is you want to back up on all laptops. And the back end just automatically comes to life, automatically scales to meet your needs. So to us, the, the mobile, you know, the remote work, hybrid work, we don't care where your data is. The whole idea of doing that source ID duplication, that means that we don't need hardware close to your hardware. Right. So we can literally back it up anywhere, even that T1 line, you know, as long as, you know, and, and your DSL line and your cable modem, whatever it is you're, that, that's happening, we, we, we really decrease the amount of bandwidth needed to back up remote data. So to us, it was just a, okay, I guess we'll back up these now, right? Yeah. Easy, easy peasy. Um, and then we have one more uh, question, and this is about a topic I don't think anybody's talked about at all yet in 2022, and it's ransomware. Um, <laughs> so, so funny. It's a, it's a two-part question. Number one is, what are some best practices against ransomware from a data recovery, I'm sorry, data protection um, standpoint? And how do you avoid reinfection after an attack that's wow. a really interesting one you didn't, you didn't give me a lot of time to answer that one but real quick you have to separate the the protected copy from the protection right the thing that you're protecting you you can't be just storing it in um in a disk on a server in your data center and then you replicate it to another disk on another server in your data center that just doesn't work okay especially especially if that is a windows based backup server right again linux is not impervious and people are attacking vmware now etc but it's just windows i think is the, is at the forefront that that's number one right you you've got to ask your your backup product how do i protect against ransomware and then your other thing about reinfection is you need a product that can actually um, look inside your backups find uh infected data and get rid of it i know that that we have an advanced ransomware recovery system that uh, i don't have time to go into but we actually can you can send us the um you know the the signature of the the thing that you were infected with we can make sure that we that we don't re store that infection, right? Um, as well as um, a really complicated system of restoring only um, unencrypted data as well. So um, yeah, you've got to make sure you're not reinfect, you know, you wipe your system and are you doing a restore? That ransomware could have been there for quite a long time. So you have to make sure that you have a system that just stops that on the way in. Got it. Curtis, um, this was a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate your time. This was, um, I, I always learn a lot talking to you. So it's, it's always nice. I, I literally live for this. <laughs> That's probably true at this point, isn't it? Absolutely. Kind of your gig. It's kind of my gig. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to Jess. Thank you so much to everyone. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jess, our moderator. Wow, that was just incredible. Scott, Curtis, thank you so much. I feel like I could listen to you guys chat for hours. 
But as Scott mentioned, it is time to wrap things up in this webinar today. Before everyone heads out, we do have one more little bit of extra excitement to add to an already extremely exciting day. It's time for a prize giveaway. I'm going to remind you one more time, you've got to be in live attendance at the webinar today, and we will be in touch shortly about claiming your prize. Today's winner of a $300 Amazon gift card is Nestor Ramirez from Colorado. Nestor Ramirez from Colorado. Congratulations to Nestor. As always, we will reach out to you after the webinar today. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Druva for making this webinar possible. And a giant thank you to Curtis and Scott for a truly engaging conversation today. And hey, sending high fives and thank yous to all of you for attending and asking some really amazing questions. These webinars are so wonderful because they give us a chance to interact, to connect, and to explore these innovative new ideas together. I know I've learned a ton from this discussion. I hope you have as well. I hope that we will get to connect with you all at a webinar again soon. And until then, have an absolutely beautiful rest of your day.